And there's a lot of speculation as to how we could not have known. And I bet you're thinking, well, they didn't have Twitter. They didn't have Snapchat. They didn't have any of the stuff we have today that would have done that. But there's also some other reasons. And some are, some are um, uh, really not don't reflect well on the people that were running the show then in Galveston, Texas. So for example, um, some were assuming that uh, they needed to harvest the last cotton crop before releasing their, their people, um, which they were forced to do. Some would say that um, they just wanted to keep things going. Oh, and, and of course, Texas has a long history of doing its own thing. Um, <clears throat> nonetheless, uh, Juneteenth became a, a pretty popular celebration in the intervening years up until about the 1900s. And it would be the same kind of um, activity that you might enjoy uh, if you think of a typical barbecue with food and games. Everybody's bringing a special dish. We dress up. There's music. Um, and then around the, the beginning of the 1900s, we started to see a decline, uh, especially as um, uh, the people who gained their freedom began to work in uh, the labor markets of the United States. And <clears throat> generally, um, employers were less, were less open to allowing everybody to take the day off. So it was a long time until it became a national holiday. And it wasn't until 1980 when Texas became the first state in the union to make it a national holiday. Now, um, I feel like I've been talking too long about this. Does anyone have a question about Juneteenth so far and why the celebration is important? It is one of the all, it is the only um, na becoming national celebration that acknowledges the freedom of uh, people from slavery in the United States. And so for that, it's, it's one of those things that is now being called for as, the, as, a, as a national holiday. Um, first to share some music about uh, uh, Juneteenth is Kristen Ortman. Uh, but actually, we need to get a quick um, uh, technique brush up uh, from Sonia Island. We're going to use a, tech, uh, a low two in this piece. We, if you're familiar with low two, great. And if you're not yet, um, we're going to get an introduction from Sonia. And for cello players, that second finger instead of third finger. But I'll let Sonia take it away. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So yes, the piece Mrs. Ortman is going to teach us uses the F note, F natural. Is that right? You're doing it on the D string, Mrs. Ortman? All right. So F natural for violins and violas. It's where your two is right next to one. Hold up if I can see your screen. Show me a two, your one and two right next to each other. That's it. And the same for cello. That is your low note. So let's all put your low two on the D string and just hold it. Match mine. Play yours. Make it sound like mine. Low two F natural. <laughs> And then F sharp, that would be where your two is higher, violin or viola, or your three for cello. You can watch Mr. T's fingers for cello. Let's hear your high note, F sharp, hold it, play with me so we match. Good, so again, those notes are F natural, F sharp, for the sake of the little ditty, I'm gonna teach you to practice those. I'm just gonna call F natural low, F sharp high. Once again, let's hear low F natural. And high F sharp, that would be your third finger on the cello. High two with the space, violin and viola, high. Good, and even if you know these notes and have been playing them for years, it's really important to always go back and make sure we're playing them in tune, using not just your muscles to feel where they are, but use your ears to match, to make sure they sound right and they sound in tune. So this little ditty, we're gonna practice going back and forth between both high and low. It just uses D, E, high, D, E, low. That's our first line of it. Let's do that together. D, E, high, D, E, low. Ready, play. Once more. 
Ready, play. Slow. And the next line is the same, but we add a note in between. High, back to one. This is high and this is low. Let's do the second line. Ready, D. We're just walking up, walking down, up to low. Once more, this is high and this is low. Ready, play. Great, let's put together the, those first two lines. So the first one was only, this is high, this is low. The second one, we add the walking back down note. This is high and this is low. Two lines together. Check you're on your D, your fingers are hovering above their spots. It's easy for them to be in tune. Ready, play. And there's one more line to complete our second finger workout. Again, it just adds a little to what we already had for the second line. We're just adding two notes at the end. Now it's this is high and this is low. A high. Ending with your F sharp, the high two or three for cellos. Let's do the third line with A high at the end. Ready, D. A, F sharp. That's it, so we just have three little lines to give your second finger workout between high and low, or between three and two for cello. Let's put all three lines together so our first finger, or second finger will be warmed up, F sharp and F natural, starting with this is high, this is low. Check again your bows right where you want it, your fingers are hovering over the D. Ready, play. <laughs> Great, we are all warmed up and I think ready for Mrs. Ortman's piece. Got to find the unmute button. All right, I am Mrs. Ortman um, and I'm going to share with you, um, this song isn't directly um, correlated to Juneteenth, but I thought it was appropriate as we think about slaves being freed. Um, this was actually an Underground Railroad song called F Follow the Drinking Gourd. Um, and it actually was a code song to get all of the slaves that were on the Underground Railroad. Um, it was their directions to get them north from Alabama all the way up to freedom. So the Drinking Gourd is the, um, no, I can't even think of it. The Big Dipper. Sorry, couldn't think of the name of it. So that, um, then the North Star. Um, so that was the way, that was the chorus is follow the drinking gourd. So you were gonna follow that, those stars to North. Um, so I have for you a little video that we're gonna watch and I will share, oh, too early. I gotta share my screen first. Um, and it is, cool little video about this drinking gourd song. When the sun comes back and the first quail calls, follow the drinking gourd. There the old man's waiting for to carry you to freedom. Follow Now the riverbank will make a mighty good road. The dead 
trees will show you the way. So that is the the melody and the there's a chorus and a verse part um, and we're gonna actually learn both today but we're gonna start with the verse the verse is the kind of the easiest little part um, I am going to also share I have the notes written down for you so you can see them if that helps that helps me a lot so I thought I would um, make that option to you as well um, here is all right, so um, the chorus part, we're gonna be right here. And it just uses th mostly three notes, um, this first line. So we have F, G, and D. And like um, Mrs. Iceland was showing us, it's gonna be two, low two. Every time it says F, it's gonna be your second finger, F for violins, low two. And then cellos will use second finger always on the Fs. No thirds for cellos. All right, so I'm just going to play the first line and the R, by the way, I know the R isn't a note. The R just means rest. Okay, I couldn't fancy type my rest out. So I just put an R there for you. All right, so I'm just going to play it once for you so you can hear it. And it's in a different key. So it sounds a little different, but just that first line and the G the line means hold the G so the G is just a little bit longer so let's just do that first line of the chorus um, so the same thing happens twice F G D F D D all right here we go one two ready go <laughs> Right, so that's that little first section. Um, and then the last line of the chorus, um, I have the F and G put really close together because they're eighth notes. So you have And the C is, I don't know if you, a lot of you maybe haven't used the G string yet, but the C is actually on the G string. And for cellos, it's fourth finger. And for violins and violas, it's gonna be third finger on your G string, okay? So let's just try playing D and then C first. So let's just play, I'm gonna play D and then C. Just get that cross, okay? Here we go, D and then C, ready, go. Just those two notes. Okay, now let's do um, C, C, um, let's do D, C, C, D. Practice changing that bow over. 
Okay. D, C, C, D. One, two, ready, go. All right. Now we will you we'll do the sorry, that was kind of a funny rhythm. Let's try that again. So I'll just play it once more for you. So it's the follow the drinking gourd. Okay, here we go. Right on the F. Remember low, low two and second finger for cellos. Here we go. One, two, ready, go. All right. And then the last part we we haven't played it yet. I played it for you. Um, on the A. Um, it's going to be up to you whether you want to use, well, cellos, it's not up to you. Cellos, you have to use fourth finger. <laughs> or, I mean, open A, sorry. You can't use fourth finger. Um, but violins, you can pick whether to use your pinky A or you can use your open A. If it's either easier to use A, then do that. Um, if you'd rather use your fourth finger, give your fourth finger a little workout, that'd be great. All right, and cellos, you'll just have to play with the A string. All right, I'll play it one more time and then I'll have you join me. Here we go, my turn. one time now um, the whole chorus and see if we can do that whole thing and if you want to sing it in your head you can do that okay Follow. all right starting with that beginning of the of the chorus here we go one two ready go <laughs> So now, if you look at the verse, the second line of the verse is the exact same thing as the second line of the chorus. So that makes it very easy. We just need to um, look at the first line of the verse and that the first part of it, the first verse is, when the sun comes back and the, uh, sorry, when the sun comes back and the first quail calls, follow the drinking gourd. So it just has D, D, F. So again, those Ds are close together because those are eighths. So okay, so that's just that little part right there. Those two Ds are together go a little bit faster. Um, and then the follow the drinking gourd is the last part of that line. So I think we could probably do that whole line. Okay. Let's do that whole line, the verse line. Here we go. Um, and then I'm going to say one, two, three, and we're going to come in on four. It's a pickup. Okay, here we go. One, two, three. <laughs> just has the next for the old man's waiting for to carry me and these words change on, on each verse as well so that's pretty much the whole song um so i guess we could do um let me see if i can look at everybody again here um do you all want one more practice on it should we try it one more time all, all like all the way through okay let's do all the way through that sounds good all right i wish we could play with the recording but i couldn't find one that was in our good key so too bad <laughs> all right here we go 
I'll starting on four, I'll give you one, two, three. Here we go. One, two, three. <laughs> And you can look up all the words. There's tons of verses. And actually, I don't even think the recording did all of the verses. So it's kind of a neat song, the, the way they, that they learned, learned that route. All right, we'll turn it over to Mr. T. All right, thank you, everybody. Um, time for questions. Time for uh, jokes. Dope. Anyone have a question? You can raise your hand. No? Okay. All right. Well, I definitely encourage, as as, uh, as Ms. Ortman says, to to look up the the other lyrics. Uh, that can be very informative. How how we use music as a um, not just a tool for our, to get through our own days and to to learn our instruments, but to have a much more profound impact. That it has a secret code that can tell you what to do, uh, and uh, and that. Um, it's, it's also, we all know this, of course, that it's such a great device for memorizing something. And when you're talking about um, the, uh, the Underground Railroad, that was quite a harrowing journey. And you would need uh, all the tools at your disposal. And that music was a part of it is, um, is really incredible. Now, I'm gonna turn your attention to a piece that I chose today. Now, this piece um, is called uh, Lift Every Voice and Sing. It actually began as a poem. And it was premiered in 1900 by a, uh, not a chorus, but a, a, a reading group of children of about 500. And it was for Lincoln's birthday. And very soon after the poem was written, uh, the brother of the original writer uh, set it to music. And it became a, a piece of music that was very quickly adopted by the uh, um, NAACP as a very important song. And now today, it is known as the Black National Anthem. And I wanted to share with you um, the words to this piece very really quick, really quick here. Um, this should be it. There we go. So uh, printed on in the music I'll share with a little bit is this first paragraph only. And it does have these three other paragraphs here. But this is typically uh, the part of the song that is uh, part of the poem that is sung with the song. <clears throat> um, Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun, let us march on till victory is won. And now I'm going to share with you uh, what the music looks like. Uh, I, I made uh, two, uh, sorry, three different parts, um, a first violin part, a second violin and viola part, which are about the same, and a cello part. Um, and I'll display those now without further ado. So my, my, my young colleagues and, and my contemporary colleagues, raise your hand if you can see that music well. You see it okay? Can you see the lyrics too? Not as much for the lyrics, are they kind of tiny? I made it as big as possible. Um, so this, you can see that this piece is in 6-8. Who's familiar with 6-8 time? Yeah, teachers are familiar with 6-8 kids, not so much. Well, 6-8 works like this, you count to six. Well, one, two, three, four, five, six, one. And this is gonna be a very slow 6-8. Um, I'm gonna play, um, the background music to this uh, one time through, and then we'll talk about how we can participate in this piece. 
All right, tell me that you can hear my voice going one, two. Here it starts. Andrew, we can barely hear it. It's really soft. Say again. We can't very hear it very much. <laughs> Is it very soft? Yes. Oh, it's incredibly soft. Okay. Um, I wonder. Was that any better? Not any better. Oh, bummer. That was kind of a big part of <laughs> I practiced this presentation and I was hoping that that would be much better sound. Um, oh, I think this is the problem, guys. <laughs> I think I fixed it. See if this works better. Um, be, be ready to turn your volume down. It might be a bit louder. So, ready, go. <laughs> that's the first big section of the song that gets us from lift every voice and sing all the way to let it resound loud as the rolling sea oh the the arrangement is um may not be able to be be played the whole way through but if you could look at the arrangement for violin or cello and see where you might be able to play um say say the first measure and a half um if uh so the piece begins. If you could join on these notes. And then let the rest of the music go. But where can you see places that you could join in in this piece? I'd recommend any of the dotted quarter notes to be good places to join in. All right. So I'd, I'd like to play it again from the beginning with my recording. And um, I'd like to see you give it a try to, to join in on any dotted quarter notes um, in the piece. And then when the music is a little bit too much to read at once, then just pause for a second and wait for another opportunity to join in with the, the longer dotted quarter notes. All right, you're going hey, to hear me. Yes. Mr. Travers, can I add that um, all of your second fingers are going to be low unless it has a sharp on it. Thank you so much for reminding me. Yes, this piece is uses our new skill of low two. Yeah. And um, all over the place, you'll be using it on the A string and the D string, no matter what instrument you play. Okay, well, let's get ready. One, two, 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 ready, go. there 
is, is a kind of tag ending that's been used for centuries. It's called the Amen. And if you've ever been in uh, a church service that uses this, it's a very familiar, very familiar kind of sound. It's the uh, one four chord. And that's exactly what's happening here. It's been borrowed and placed into this music too. And it's very important because as uh, the Juneteenth celebration is also um, uh, draws a lot on faith. And, and the resiliency of uh, moving forward. It's also in the lyrics of this piece. All right, I'd like to take you all to the next part of the piece um, where we get to hear the lyrics, sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. And I think one of the enduring things about this piece that makes it such an important one that keeps going and connected to Juneteenth and everything else uh, the, as a black national anthem, for example, is that it acknowledges the past while talking about the hope present uh, now and, and hopefully for the future. Um, one thing that happens in this music is that all of the parts play the same notes. And I thought we might be able to try this first ver verse of the middle section here. And that's where it goes, um, uh, full, full of the faith that the dark past has brought us. These notes here, A, G, E. So if you could find any A, G, E in your instrument. And as Ms. Ms. Zortman mentioned earlier, a few violin players <clears throat> want to play A with four, G with three, and then E with one. We cello players have to go open A, four, one, or if you really like to learn the new stuff down here, one, oh, three is how you play that lower octave. Okay, so let's try this section. Um, playing the eighth notes, A, G, E. We'll do three of those in a row, like this. And it ends on G, okay? Here we go. One, two, go. A, G, E, A, G, E. Now the next part uses A flat, and if you're not familiar with A flat, that's okay. Um, as a, let's see here, as a violin player, um, you can bring your fourth finger to touch your third finger here. And that fourth finger will now be playing A flat. As a cello player, it's a little trick here, but I'll show you the trick here. Change where your, so your fourth finger plays G, replace that fourth finger with your third finger. Now your third finger is responsible for the note G, and your fourth finger can play A flat. So here's how a cellist could do it. A flat with four, G with three, F with one. Sounds like this. And then we have to go back and find E. First violin players will already have their first finger there, the lucky ducks. Okay, let's give it a try. A flat, G. F, A flat, G, F. One, ready, go. A flat, G, find E. Okay, so let's play this middle section and see if we can join in on the A, G, E's and the A flat, G, F's. I'm going to back up the recording a little bit and I'll, I'll give you a ready, go. All right, get ready. since I'm <laughs> playing with you and we can't do a hold together over the internet, I'm just going to get ready to play the end. So I'm going to back it up a little bit and let's see each other to the end of this work. Get ready.
can certainly find uh, other examples of this piece. I watched one the other day that was a, uh, a distanced choir singing in, in a style that you would typically hear on Juneteenth. Um, and so I encourage you to find other versions of this besides the, the kind of string quartet version I did. Apologies to my colleagues in the violin department. I played your, your part on, on the cello. It sounded a lot better than when I, I tried it myself on the violin. I just don't have good vibrato on violin yet. Um, I wanted to share a little bit more about, <clears throat> let's see, um, No, I think that's that's all the more I wanted to share about that song. I had some other ideas in my head. Um, I, I know we we're a little light on the uh, uh, the content of music today, but I do want to make these these uh, parts available to you. So I'm going to talk to Ethan and make sure they get emailed out to everybody who registered today, so that you can have a, a part to to play and your own your own copy of this piece. Um, it was really nice to be able to organize with my colleagues and and have a um, an emphasis on Juneteenth this year. We're, we're trying to have a theme throughout the rest of the summer. We're going to try to do these every two weeks. And our next one, um, colleagues, I'm, I'm blanking. I feel like I need to go look something up real quick because I've forgotten. What was the next one I decided to do? Oh, yes, it's going to be um, the, right after the 4th of July. We'll be on the, on the 9th. So our next theme is 4th of July pieces. Um, Colleagues, do you have anything else to add while I'm still thinking? No, just thank you so much to everyone who came today. Thanks for playing with us. Yeah, I guess ditto that. Thanks for, uh, hope, hopefully you can do a bit more research. And there's a lot of um, little tunes that you can, especially ones like Follow the Drinking Gourd, those little songs that have like three or four notes in them. And you can maybe almost figure them out on your own sometimes. Um, uh, just put them in an easier key, start on D and see what happens. The, um, are, are we aware of the, uh, what's it called? Uh, there's a, a folk song um, repository. It was made by, a, uh, I think, a music librarian from London, if I remember right. But um, there are, are enormous lists of, of folk songs and from all sorts of backgrounds, um, whether it's the mountains of Appalachia or uh, from the plantations of, um, of, uh, of the South. And the, um, the neat thing about those songs is they endure and they have so much meaning and, and as Follow the Drinking Gourd has instructions um, for, for travel in a harsh environment and uh, lift every voice and sing has now become the national anthem of, of, uh, of, of Juneteenth. So um, uh, thank you very much everybody who's come to, to see us today. Do you have any last questions or thoughts or suggestions for next time? I, I see Christy getting ready. We'll, we'll have plenty of time. Go ahead, take your time. Sorry, I forgot to stop sharing. Oh, a website or music that we can play in the classroom when students are working, you teach in grade four. Um, my first thought is Spotify um, and any of the other streaming sites, although I bet a district might have some restrictions on some of those things. Um, colleagues, thoughts for for music to put in the background. I mean, for me, I would, I would bring in my classical music CDs, um, music without words, so it's less distracting when you're studying and reading. Other thoughts? Um, what I use sometimes, mostly with younger children, but we get for any age, I just get any kind of classical music's greatest hit CD, and there's usually a lot of variety in music without words, so you can if you want just to narrow it down to the slower ones or the fast ones, you use it for different kinds of activities. Uh, that's what I've done. Um, Christy, I have um, an, a list of inappropriate folk songs if you'd like um, me to send that to you um, because I know there are a lot now that are considered um, very inappropriate and I would never have known that unless I read the lists. 
So I will, okay, awesome. I will send that to you. I'm gonna copy your address so I don't lose it. That's a, it's a really excellent point um, Christy brings up. Some of the folk songs are, reflect their times. And they, as we look at them through the lens of uh, 2020, they are not appropriate anymore. They deal with, um, they use uh, uh, words and references to others that are um, discriminatory and in fact racist. And it's hard to navigate um, that history because it's, it hasn't been kept so robustly and it certainly hasn't been, been shared in our, our curriculum as much. Um, we just remember these songs from growing up and we didn't realize that they have some, some darker history to them. So um, as musicians, I think it's a, incumbent upon us to, to do a lot of learning very quickly and to keep that learning going so that we can share them with you, our colleagues and, and our young students here too. Um, so I'm really glad that got brought up. Okay, we have uh, a question from Facebook, uh, from the Sioux City Symphony webpage, uh, asking about how we should get into classical music. Where do you think you should start? That's a good one. Um, start, start by listening to what you like is where I began. I wore out a tape of um, Tchaikovsky's 1812 Overture that my father had made from an LP. And uh, I really wore it out. I played it every day. And I think it's why I love the cello so much because it begins with that great cello introduction. But beginning with what I liked, I then started to listen to this piece and this composer and, and uh, it kind of got diversified from there. Um, how else would you advise folks to get into classical music, my dear colleagues? Um, I would say I grew up with my parents always putting on NPR. So I always heard public radio and it's just kind of in the background. So that's a way that you don't even really have to make a choice of what you're going to listen to or set aside time, just have it on. And that's, that's a really great way to get kids or yourself um, just listening. And, and like Andrew said, you'll find what you like and then you can tune into that and look for more of that. Um, like if you have Spotify or anything like that, that's a really great way to kind of form your own station. If there's a piece you like, just have it form your its station around that and you'll probably find more pieces that you like as well. Um, and I'd say from the, the symphonies Facebook page, they've been putting up a lot of things. Aside from this, there's musicians doing many performances or other kind of outreach things. That's a way to get involved with the community. Um, and hopefully you'll be able to come to concerts again sometime soon. See what you like and what you enjoy and meet other people that are into it too. I, I guess that's my only thoughts too is, um, I mean, you can start from names that everyone knows like Beethoven. Do I like Beethoven? I don't know. Try piano, Beethoven piano, Beethoven symphonies, Beethoven. He wrote all kinds of stuff, not just for one instrument. Um, and then if you don't like that, try a different era maybe. Um, otherwise, yeah, just you can use those tools like uh, Shazam even and say, what, who wrote this or what is this? Or, and then go kind of from there and see what you kind of like. All right. Um, and, you know, sometimes it, I mean, these days it's, um, it seems so easy to connect mm -hmm. to music. When, when I was growing up, I had to rely on, on borrowing CDs from my cello teacher or borrowing a tape from my cello teacher. Uh, but now I, a few search terms and you're going to be flooded with more results than you could possibly examine in a lifetime. Um, so if you, you can start with a simple ter search term like classical. Um, if you've heard of a particular composer, search that name and, and usually the other, other results that come with it might start pointing you in other directions. Um, for some people, it's the kind of classical music you like. For example, some people like to hear only solo piano and, and just love the sound of solo piano. So you can look up composers that have done uh, piano works. I happen to be really partial to string trios, string quartets, all of the small ensemble stuff that's just string players. Okay, once in a while a piano player can join us. Just kidding, I love it all. It's wonderful music to me. And uh, if I was to search out music in, in the classical idiom, I would start there, you know, just string quartets, uh, uh, symphonies. Uh, uh, these, are, these are the technical terms that we musicians are so used to. 
that I understand that our, our fans maybe aren't familiar with. So we're glad to, glad to share with you. If you have further questions about how to connect with classical music, um, email us. We'll get to you and help you out with that. Well, um, I see, Christy, you posted, can Spotify music be used in the classroom? Um, it, it, it really depends on each district, doesn't it? Um, and I would, I would certainly check with, um, you know, most, I, I, would, I would check with your site principal um, on, on that. I think I'm also a teacher. I teach orchestra, so I don't really need those in my classroom. Um, but I believe that there's teachers in our district that, that do use that as long as they um, have certain, like, I don't know if you can get rid of ads or some something so there's not these random blaring ads in the middle um, or if there's a better way for that. But I think, I think it's um, it, within the realm of, of law or whatever, but you just need to check with, see if there's any specific things that they want you to do in your classroom. So. Okay, everybody. Thank you very much once again. Uh, last chance for questions, jokes. It's good to have you. We look forward to seeing you in about two weeks, Monday, same time. All right. Bye, everyone. Thank Let's you. Bye. Bye, Bye thanks for coming, you. guys.